Hello, and thank you for joining today's NCCN patient webinar, Know What Your Doctors Know, Metastatic Breast Cancer. My name is Tanya Fisher, and I am the moderator for today's webinar. NCCN is a not-for-profit alliance of 32 leading cancer centers across the United States devoted to patient care, research, and education. NCCN Foundation is a nonprofit organization that raises funds for NCCN patient resources, including new and updated patient guidelines, as well as patient webinars. These are funded using financial support from generous donors. The NCCN guidelines for patients are based on the NCCN clinical practice guidelines used by healthcare providers worldwide. They explain the same options for cancer care, but are written for patients and their caregivers, family, and friends. You can view and download free copies of the guidelines from patients from the NCCN website. High quality printed copies of the book can be purchased through Amazon. If you ordered a free book when you registered for this webinar, you should be receiving it shortly. The Know What Your Doctors Know webinars complement the NCCN guidelines for patients. They cover a series of topics discussed by expert presenters. Viewers have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. This brings us to the presenters for today's webinar. I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Anthony Elias. Dr. Elias is Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Following Dr. Elias, we, hear, we will hear from Carly Andrews, who is Breast Center Nursing Supervisor at UC Health, part of the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Our third presenter today is Mary Lou Smith, patient advocate from the Research Advocacy Network. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Elias. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Anthony Elias, a Professor of Medical Oncology at the University of Colorado. I'm also a member of the NCCN uh, Breast Panel. And today I'm pleased to discuss consideration and advances in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. In general, the goals of care when considering metastatic breast cancer is typically not to increase the likelihood of cure, as that is not yet uh, achievable, even if an ultimate goal. Rather, it is to prolong survival and improve the quality of life by de decreasing symptoms from the disease, balancing the toxicity of treatment with its ability to control disease and manage symptoms. In other words, to help the patient live as long as possible while maintaining the best quality of life. An exception might be the situation of oligometastatic disease. Oligo means few. Thus, these patients have a very limited number of sites of overt disease. And in some cases, we consider more aggressive treatment, systemic therapy, as would be given in the curative setting, with additional localized treatment, surgery, and or radiation therapy to specific sites of disease. This concept continues to evolve and is being explored in many clinical trials. In addition to getting a complete picture regarding disease status, symptoms that may be disease related and uh, patient support systems, patient and family education regarding the disease process is paramount. The care team typically includes at the core, the medical oncologist, advanced practitioners, and an oncology nurse. Because I work at a major cancer center, I'm blessed with the ability to provide additional supports, as well as having resources in my colleagues. Discussion of logistics of treatment and the physical and psychological needs of the patient frequently involve an oncology social worker, financial counselor, psychologist, support group, and whomever else would be needed. An important aspect is to discuss the role of the patient's caregiver at home. We would want to address goals of care, understand the symptoms the patient currently has, what to expect from treatment, how to manage the potential toxicities of treatment. Options for treatment typically include standard of care options, for example, to follow the guidelines in the NCCN guidelines but also what clinical trials may be suitable for the situation the patient finds themselves in. 
Up to 25% of patients present with metastatic disease that is already detectable by scan and by symptoms. However, most patients will present with local regional disease, receive therapy, and then relapse in various sites. The risk to develop metastatic disease is based on anatomic stage, how large the tumor was in the breast, are the lymph nodes involved, and how the primary breast cancer was treated, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, anti-HER2 therapy, and all of these therapies have been shown to reduce the risk of relapse. In general, relapses occur over time, but the timing is related to the biology of the tumor. A very low-grade tumor that's ER positive and HER2 negative may have a risk of relapse that extends across 20 years. About 50% of relapses would have occurred within five years. However, if the tumor were triple negative, PR, PR, and HER2 negative, then most relapses will occur within five years and far fewer would be late. How do you tell if a relapse has occurred? Typically, because the patient has some symptoms that are not their usual everyday experience. Pain in bones most, is most common, but other things like lumps, feeling poorly, or other symptoms may guide the oncologist to evaluate. Scans done to evaluate symptoms are typically useful with a biopsy to confirm metastasis. However, routine scans, in other words, those not for cause, done every three months, have just been able to pick up metastatic disease about two to three months before a clinical presentation, but have not been shown to help survive longer. Thus, we do not encourage their use. Tumor markers in blood have also not been shown to be useful, at least as of yet, to prolong survival. The typical markers such as CEA and uh, CA2729 or CA15-3, uh, they are fairly insensitive with up to 35% with overt widespread metastasis with normal tumor markers and are also sometimes falsely positive. In other words, elevated with no evidence of disease within five years of the test, despite numerous scans and diagnostic procedures. Circulating tumor DNA is more accurate and is currently in clinical trials to evaluate utility. Breast cancer is typically defined by the ER, PR, and HER2 status. However, this can change over time, in part depending on treatment. Thus, for ER positive breast cancer, about 20% might lose the estrogen receptor. And, uh, but if you had a triple negative, sometimes ER can be re-expressed in up to 10%. Similar findings are seen in HER2 positive uh, disease and heterogeneity can be observed. Certain mutations may develop over time. PI3 kinase mutations can be present in the original tumor, but Estrogen receptor mutations, in other words, ESR1, um, and HER2 mutations typically arise across treatment and are far more common in the metastatic disease than the original disease. For this reason, we recommend rebiopsy of metastatic disease from time to time to help guide treatment. As a broad outline of treatment, we typically obtain staging scans, CT scan, sometimes bone scans, sometimes PET scans, to understand the extent of disease and how we might evaluate the benefit from treatment. We typically talk about cycles of therapy, usually measured in three to four weeks duration, uh, in which the pattern of treatment is then repeated. For example, if endocrine therapy for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer um, is given, we might give an aromatase inhibitor on a daily basis, but a CDK4-6 inhibitor might be given three weeks out of four and might require monitoring of blood counts at a particular timing. 
Chemotherapy is typically given in cycles. We then restage with scans, typically if the tumor masses are stable or have shrunk, then the therapy is working and we would continue, but may need to adjust dosing if undue toxicity. If the tumor is growing, then under most circumstances, we would need to change therapy. It is important to recognize that radiologists are expert in reading scans, but they do not necessarily know the clinical context and frequently use different language and criteria for judging change. It is therefore important for your medical oncologist to integrate these findings with the clinical situation. This same process is used for clinical trials and for later line therapies. What is the role of clinical trials? Well, standard of care represents the best to date. And it's typically established through prior clinical trials that might have been 10 to 15 years ago. There may be more than one option. Typically, they could be improved by increasing efficacy and decreasing toxicity. Clinical trials are testing new treatments that hold promise in preclinical and or clinical settings. These are not a, felt to be a last resort, but are rather trials in certain clinical settings, frequently done as a first option. A phase one trial is the testing of a new agent or combination. There are two types. One, a new agent is being evaluated to find out how to give it, what dose, what schedule, um, to then develop future trials to understand its toxicities in people and then obtain preliminary information about whether it might work in a particular disease. A second type might be to combine an old drug with a new one to take advantage of possible synergies for development in a particular type of tumor. A phase two trial typically would take the recommended dose and schedule from a phase one trial and then test it in a particular setting to see if it's active enough to warrant further testing. A phase three trial typically is randomized and comparing us, uh, the new regimen with a standard of care to see if it might be better. Phase four trials are done by pharmaceutical companies typically after marketing approvals to make the agent available to a broader population. Clinical trials are typically listed in clinicaltrials.gov. I'll briefly review some of the standard care options as indicated in the guidelines from NCCN, ASCO, and others. We'll start with estrogen receptor positive disease. Since estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is highly sensitive to estrogen and progesterone, as both survival and proliferation factors, one must know whether the ovaries are working or not. If they are, then tamoxifen, which competes with estrogen, would be used, or else the ovaries need to be suppressed before being able to use any of the other agents. The combination of oral CDK4-6 inhibitors plus anti-estrogen agents demonstrate modest progression-free and overall survival for first-line treatment and currently are recommended. Um, other drugs are coming along. So the oral SIRDs, which are selective estrogen receptor degraders. Um, we have fulvestrant, which has the disadvantage as two shots in the uh, rear end um, monthly. So it's quite inconvenient for long-term treatment. Oral, orally bioavailable SIRDs are currently in clinical trial. One such, elacitrant, appears to be somewhat more effective than standard anti-estrogenic uh, agents in later line therapy in a recently reported phase three study. So it is likely that it'll be approved by the FDA in the near future. Trials combining oral SIRDs with CDK4-6 inhibitors are in progress and should be available soon. 
In later line therapy, we typically check for the presence or absence of PI3 kinase mutations. If present, then we can consider the addition of alpelicib or alpelicib, a specific inhibitor added to endocrine therapy. As a general rule, there's a law of diminishing return. In other words, the first line endocrine therapy works the best and the first line chemotherapy option works the best of the chemotherapy options. Typically for metastatic breast cancer, single agent chemotherapy is recommended over combination chemotherapy regimens. Um, they have generally not shown any survival disadvantage and are far less toxic. Very recently, later line therapy for HER2 negative disease includes antibody drug conjugates, otherwise known as ADCs. ADCs are antibodies linked to a toxin. TDXD, otherwise known as trastuzumab, sorry, FAM trastuzumab deruxtecan um, NKXI, commercially known as NHER2. Um, has been demonstrated uh, to have significant activity compared with chemotherapy. Sasituzumab gobatecan targets trope 2 on the cell surface of most breast cancers. How to sequence these therapies is still uncertain and in part would be influenced by the relative toxicities of the agents. It is important to balance side effects with the potential benefits. In um, Triple negative metastatic breast cancer first line therapy. Triple negative breast cancer is aggressive. Chemotherapy is the major option. However, recent immune therapy added to chemotherapy appears to be beneficial. Thus, we check the PDL1 status. The immune system has a, a system of multiple on and off switches, so it can rev up fast if exposed to a, a pathogens such as a virus, and then calm down when the infection is over. Many, and probably most tumors, can take advantage of the off switches to turn off the immune system against themselves. We now have blocking antibodies that can block these off switches. The two most common are anti-PD-1 or PDL one and anti-CTLA-4 antibodies. PD-1 antibodies are approved for first-line treatment of metastatic uh, triple negative breast cancer, provided the tumor microenvironment expresses PDL1, and it's combined with chemotherapy. In later line therapy, chemotherapy, typically single agents and sequence, is given, and it would be important to check for germline BRCA mutations to be able to consider PARP inhibitors. Antibody drug conjugates are now approved, as mentioned, for later line therapy for triple negative, and were shown to be more active than standard chemotherapy agents in that setting. In HER2 positive breast cancer, um, HER2 positive breast cancers can be either estrogen receptor positive or uh, ER negative, and this may influence treatment options. In general, chemotherapy plus anti-HER2 antibodies is considered first line, with the addition of endocrine therapy after completion of the chemotherapy portion. The anti-HER2 antibodies are continued indefinitely if no progression. Later line options include antibody drug conjugates, including the TDXD, as well as TDM1, which is known as adotrastuzumab emtansine, otherwise known as Cadsila, um, all of which target HER2, but have different toxins attached. Many others are in clinical trials. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors, TKIs, that target HER2 are also approved to catnib and neratinib, which may have particular utility against metastatic tumor in the brain. Later, one can combine various types of chemotherapy plus anti-HER2 antibodies 
And it's been shown that it is typically beneficial to continue anti HER2 therapy through multiple lines of treatment. There are HER2 mutations, and neratinib has some activity against those, and tricatinib is being tested against those currently. Other supportive care is are important. Bone strengthening, strengthening agents such as zolendronate or denosumab can reduce pain and fracture risk for bone lesions. Localized radiation therapy is useful to reduce pain and fracture risk from bone lesions or other threatening lesions. And for CNS disease, surgery, stereotactic radiation therapy or a combination are typically considered. And I will stop here, and I recognize that I might have left you with many more questions you had to start with, and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for letting me be a part of this webinar today. Um, so just to start a little bit about me, I have been a breast oncology nurse for about five years, and I'm currently the nursing supervisor at the UC Health Breast Center here in Aurora, Colorado. I also help support one of our providers who specializes in young women's breast cancer. My goal today is to help provide some common ground on a few topics, including treatments, side effects, and supportive care. I hope to normalize some of this discussions, some of this discussion as a means to help you take this information back to your care team and advocate for your needs and wishes. I'll begin by reviewing a very important comment made by Dr. Elias in the beginning of the presentation that the goal of caring for metastatic breast cancer patients is to help patients live as long as possible while maintaining the best quality of life. Dr. Elias reviewed treatment options that include hormonal therapies, oral anti-cancer therapies, IV chemotherapy, IV immunotherapies, and a multitude of targeted therapies. And again notes this aim that it's, the aim is to balance side effects or toxicity with benefit. Helping patients maintain the best possible quality of life is this balance of this ongoing balance um, conversation of balancing toxicity and benefits. It's always the goal to offer treatment options with the least amount of toxicity and the maximal amount of benefit. We try to avoid treatments that involve IV chemotherapy because it can be cumbersome from a toxicity standpoint as well as a time standpoint. Um, patients are not always trying to come into the clinic um, more than they need to, or sometimes that requires weekly infusion. So we do try to avoid that. I always tell patients and members of the patient's care team that we have to prioritize the patient's time, their precious and valuable time with their family members and loved ones. Let's try to keep everyone, try to keep patients out of the clinic and at home and able to do the things that they want to be doing. So next I'll review the most common side effects that we see among various side, um, amongst various treatments. We know that breast cancer affects our population at a higher rate than most other cancers, especially for women. Something valuable that comes in spite of the, this disease incidence is the time, manpower, resources, research, and years of experience we have gathered over the last several decades. Along these lines, the doctor I work with always tells patients, we've gotten pretty good at giving chemotherapy or anti-cancer therapy. Now, of course, we'd love to not have to give any cancer ther anti-cancer therapy at all, but when we do, we hope to make it tolerable. When I do chemo teaching, I like to offer tips of how to manage side effects, but also it is important to know when to call. Not to confuse matters, but I also like to add, please always call, when in doubt, call. So here's a list of the most common side effects I see in our patient population spanning all different ty treatment types. Next, I'm going to call out just a few specific symptoms and we'll offer, offer some tips and when to call parameters for some of these, but feel free to ask any follow-up questions in the Q&A as time allows. So for starters, fatigue. Fatigue is the biggest, um, the number one common symptom of any of the treatments that we offer. And actually studies show that the more active a patient is, this helps fight fatigue. Um, also, we wanna address sleep hygiene. Is the patient having meaningful awake hours and meaningful sleep hours? Looking at ways to improve sleep can help optimize daytime energy levels. If fatigue is not tolerable and you're not able to do the things you want to do at home, then that's when I would encourage patients to voice this to their care teams. 
Next, I'll touch on nausea and vomiting. Again, we've gotten pretty good at managing nausea and vomiting. We have, um, I always tell patients we have a big arsenal of medications to use. We have prescription medicines that are long acting, which can be helpful typically given around the more acute times of treatment cycles. Um, and then also want to touch on this idea of alternating medicines. So typically patients have a couple of anti nausea medicines at home that can be given anywhere between every four to six hours. And it's a good idea to be alternating those medicines so that they're peaking in your system at different times. Beyond this, ways to manage um, nausea are having small, frequent meals, always keeping something on your stomach and choosing um, food choices that are high in proteins and fats are good. And then hydration, St staying hydrated cures all. Hydration, water intake can help with fatigue, nausea, vomiting, bowel problems. It truly is the intervention that keeps on giving. A recommended when to call parameter is if you're not eating and drinking adequately, whether that's a parameter set by you or your care team, you need to call. Or if you have symptoms of dehydration like headaches, dizziness, we want you to call your care team. Lastly, I'll touch on changes in sexual function. Many of our patients experience vaginal, vaginal dryness related to estrogen deprivation. Medical oncologists have widely adopted the notion that estrogen products in small doses used locally in the vaginal area is safe. This has evolved over the time, over the last several years that I've been in breast oncology care, so I wanted to call it out to this group. So please bring this up to your care team if this is a side effect that is undermanaged for you. Okay, next I wanna to touch on a to the topic of shared decision-making and the multidisciplinary team. So the multidisciplinary team is a, pa a facet of patient-centered care where the patient is at the center of their care and then accompanying on this team is the physician, advanced practice providers like the nurse practitioner or physician's assistant, oncology nurses, support staff like schedulers and authorization team members, financial support staff, social workers, radiologists, radiation oncologists, physical therapists, palliative care team members, and the patient's own caregivers and family. And then we have shared decision making, which is an approach where physicians and patients share the best available evidence when faced with the task of making treatment decisions and where patients are supported to consider options to choose to achieve informed preferences. This is a key component of a pa of patient centered care and highlights the importance of the physician patient relationship in optimizing health outcomes, especially on an individual level, because that can mean different things for each patient. One study on obstacles to shared decision making identified three consistent barriers to successful shared decision making. Number one, patients not quite understanding their recommendation, having trouble understanding what's being advised to them. Number two, being patients being concerned about toxicity and side effects. And number three, poor physician communication, meaning something's just not clicking with the way the oncologist is conveying the recommendation. So how can we as healthcare providers work to eliminate these barriers? We can ask our patients how they best process and learn new information. Do you like visual aids, written materials? Are stats and numbers helpful or is it more anecdotal information that is helpful? I always say knowledge is power in any decision making and it is our job to ensure that recommendations are conveyed in a way that the patient is able to meaningfully understand their treatment options and the road ahead. It is difficult to set expectations when it comes to side effects. For me, I like, um, I think the same principle stands for each patient. Knowledge is power. The more information I can give through the experiences I've had and the evidence that we know, the better the patient can accept or not plan for and manage the treatment side effects. If I'm part of a conversation in which a patient is on the fence about accepting a treatment option, I like to set the tone by saying there's no expectation that the patient be miserable or endure intolerable treatment with the tolerability scale set by you, the individual patient. We think that with the tools that we have and the doses we are administering, we can get you through this, but if it's intolerable, you can stop. Then at least you know that, at least you know what you can and cannot tolerate. Knowledge is power. And in this case, it can bring peace. Peace that you knew you attempted the path and peace with holding your values strong and prioritizing what matters most to you individually. Or perhaps with the information you have at hand, you feel it is not in your personal best interest to proceed. The choice is always yours. 
Now, I'm not a physician, but for me, helping my patients be as well-informed as possible by sharing my experience that is evidence-based and on-the-job care of breast cancer patients is how I work to communicate effectively with my patients. All right, lastly, I want to discuss and review some very helpful tools to know about. I can't stress enough how important side effect management is. Part of finding the balance between toxicity and tolerance is how well your side effects are managed. Your healthcare team is there. To, your healthcare team is there to help you. Like I said, we've been giving toxic treatments for decades and are constantly relooking at best practices for side effect management. So please speak up to your care team if a particular symptom is not well managed. This goes for pain too. If your disease is causing pain, this should be a top priority for you and your care team. Pain is one of the biggest inhibitors to quality of life, which brings me to palliative care. In its simplest definition, palliative care is side effect and symptom management. I am a proponent of early and often for including palliative care specialists in your care team. Sometimes patients are not interested in adding yet another referral or an appointment to their plan, to their care plan. However, I suggest asking your team ways that they are willing to be creative with your time. Perhaps palliative care visits can be done virtually through telehealth or visits done during your treatment appointments, like in the infusion center. Finally, psychosocial support. Again, palliative care is a great place to start or be introduced to these services. However, an individual referral is also reasonable. Psychosocial support can be helpful in navigating the meaning of your diagnosis, how you want to approach it, and how to manage it. These team members can help drill down what your balance of toxicity and quality of life looks like. This is typically called a goal, a goal of care conversation. Again, early and often, establishing, voicing, and living your values can help bring peace to this journey. And I think that is all of my time. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. And I'll now turn it over to Mary Lou, our patient advocate. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Lou Smith. I'm a patient advocate and co-founder of the Research Advocacy Network. And I'm here to share with you some of the reflections and concerns of patients with metastatic breast cancer. Here are statements about living with cancer from patients who are doing just that. These are patients with metastatic disease interviewed on a webinar sponsored by SHARE earlier this year. Their advice included, enjoy everyday events like taking a walk, going to family gatherings, gardening, keep a journal, share it with your doctor, include what is and what is not related to treatment or disease because you don't always know, share feelings and concerns and sensitivities with your physician. Having it written down takes the pressure off of remembering when did that happen, two weeks ago, last week, how long ago. Be your own advocate. Let the team know you, how you approach life. Show them who you are and, most importantly, what you need. Reinforce you want to be treated like a person, not a number. And in the face of a scary diagnosis, be positive. Focus on what can be done. Focus on treatment options. Ask lots of questions. Listen to the possibilities offered by the healthcare team. And above all, don't let metastatic breast cancer define you. Living with metastatic breast cancer means making each treatment count in months and years of life. Clinical trials are providing new treatments to extend those years. Seven years ago, we didn't think that immunotherapies worked for breast cancer patients. CDK4-6 inhibitors were given FDA approval in 2015. And antibody drug conjugates, which were discussed by Dr. Elias, were in limited use. The next generation of these drugs was FDA approved in 2020. So the strategies we have to control disease and get patients with metastatic breast cancer to the next treatment have expanded. That means hope, hope for longer life and hope for treatments tailored to a specific subtype of cancer, offering reduced toxicity and hopefully increased efficacy. And that's why tumor testing is so important. As Dr. Elias said, the tumor can change over time. A rebiopsy may be required to give the patient the best chance of a treatment targeted at a specific mutation. Clinical trials can also give you information for treatment decision making. Research Advocacy Network conducted focus groups with patients with metastatic breast cancer. 
we wanted to know what these patients would consider meaningful outcomes of clinical trials. We asked them how they would use the results of the trial. Simply put, patients wanted to know how long will this drug work and what's it going to do to me? What are the side effects? What will be my quality of life? Will it be close to normal as I am now? Will it change in physical capabilities? There was concern about being incapacitated. And then there's the emotional effects, depression, distress, anxiety. Patients want to know that the trial is relevant to them, which means knowing something about the people in the trial, their age, their race, ethnicity, and gender, the aggressiveness of their disease, the number of lines of treatment prior, and their subtype. Bottom line, how much did the patients in the trial look like me? Women and men with metastatic breast cancer have difficult treatment decisions to make. Do you try a trial as your first-line treatment or go with existing single agent or multiple drug regimens? The trial will offer a new approach and the hope of a better response, but the established treatment side effects and efficacy are known. If you wait, will you then be ineligible for trials because many clinical trials are in first-line therapy. Do you take the most aggressive treatments in the hope of a longer response, or will the side effects limit your quality of life and future options? Is it better to be treated at a university hospital where research is ongoing, or better to stay closer to home where you have a support system and less life disruption? And looking at the long view, how are you going to be able to live your life with ongoing treatment? How are these treatment decisions made? By the doctor, by the patient, or by both? How does the patient want to be involved? These statements were made by patients with metastatic breast cancer responding to a survey the Research Advocacy Network conducted in 2018. The responses reflect the three models of decision making. The paternalistic model, where the physician decides the treatment to implement, I go with my oncologist decision or the informed model where the patient makes the decision. I'm the driver of my treatments. We discuss options, but I make the final decision about everything. Or, I feel very active in the decision-making process to add, change, or forego a treatment. I work closely with my PA, oncologist, surgeon, and RADOC. Or the shared decision-making model that Carly discussed. I like that I am fully involved in my treatment decisions. And of course, unfortunately, there were some patients who felt devalued. My suggestions were acknowledged and then ignored. The shared decision-making approach is preferred by most patients. In a shared model, the patient and physician partner to look at the treatment options and come to a mutual decision on the best treatment given the effectiveness of the treatment, the physical side effects, and the patient preferences and values. And trust is foundational to this model. Patients and physicians prioritize benefits and side effects differently. Two patients may not weigh the risks and benefits the same in making their decision. Patient preferences are unique to the individual. And 40% of patients report less than desired involvement in their decisions. A study of shared decision-making in metastatic breast cancer led by Dr. Gabrielle Rock from University of Alabama found patients and oncologists thought effectiveness of treatments and types and severity of side effects were important in decision-making. But patients went beyond benefits and side effects. They factored in cost and travel time, work, children living at home, and the ability to attend important life events, like graduations, weddings, or the birth of a grandchild. Patient preferences reflected a wide range of concerns about how treatment impacts life. In other words, all side effects are not created equal. Fatigue that means I need to take a nap in the afternoon is not the same as fatigue that means I cannot work. Peripheral neuropathy that causes a mild tingling sensation in my fingers is not the same as peripheral neuropathy that causes numbness and pain so severe I cannot move my fingers and can no longer button buttons or safely pick up a glass with one hand. A shared understanding strengthens the patient-oncologist alliance, builds that trust relationship and creates a framework for future ways to support the patient and their family. Physicians do what they're trained to do. They rely on the evidence, what is known from research about effectiveness of treatments, and what is known about side effects of those same drugs. 
they acknowledge they cannot predict a particular individual's side effects or benefits. They use statistical estimates in making their recommendations, but they don't always ask the patient what they want and value. And patients want to be asked. Their preferences change over time. And this could be a role for the caregiver, to initiate the conversation about preferences at each decision-making encounter. And here are some resources I wanted to share with you. NBC Connect is a free web and mobile-friendly tool that helps you store important information about your disease history, experiences, as well as your quality of life. NBC Connect also provides researchers and clinicians with a powerful database that can drive research discoveries and advances. You can go to NBC Connect website and join the registry and or explore the data that's available. NBC Breast Cancer Trial Search is a web-based personalized clinical trial matching tool. It was developed by breastcancertrials.org, and its goal is to make finding out about clinical trial options for metastatic breast cancer easier, faster, and more precise, and to encourage patients to consider clinical trials as a routine option for care. Metastatic Breast Cancer Project is sponsored by the Broad Institute and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. The unique genetic information in your cancer could pull, hold the key to rapid advances in cancer treatment. By looking at the DNA in your samples, researchers can make discoveries that will ultimately lead to a better understanding and faster advances in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. And here is a list of advocate organizations that provide services to men and women with metastatic breast cancer. And thank you for your time and attention. Okay, we had a few questions um, submitted via email, so I'm going to read those first, and then we will um, go through what we see in the Q&A box. Um, so there were some questions about emerging treatment strategies for um, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. Um, and so is triazuzumab an option for those who have progressed on a first-line CDK4-6 inhibitor with an aromatase inhibitor, or is a combination of a new CERD and targeted therapy more appropriate? So um, I'll, I'll answer that. Uh, so trastuzumab druxtecan um, just recently uh, presented its uh, data comparing not so this is a anti her2 targeted adc but it's so potent that it actually can uh, treat her2 1 plus and 2 plus fish negative so patients whose tumors are considered her2 negative in other words not amplified not too many copies of the gene um and it was just a very impressive uh, result so it is now approved for uh, HER2 negative, but one plus or two plus, so not zero. Um, uh, for systemic therapy, the problem with the drug is that it does have a fairly high risk of interstitial lung disease which can cause cough, shortness of breath, and uh, which can even be lethal. And so one has to monitor that particular toxicity with serial CT scans and have a very um, um, forward thinking approach if anything such as that actually arises. So at this point, I would say that the toxicity is, um, would not persuade me to use this in the second line endocrine uh, setting. Um, it is approved for a second and third line uh, chemo setting. So I would uh, choose an endocrine therapy, uh, for example, fulvestrant, if that hadn't been given before, plus um, erolimus or alpalicid or something of that nature, uh, depending on PI3 kinase mutations. Um, and certainly the, I'm looking forward to the oral surds becoming available.
What role does new classes of drugs such as PROTAC and CDK7 inhibitor play in treating metastatic breast cancer? So there are a lot of new agents that are being tested. Um, so the CDK7 inhibitor is basically um, part of the cell cycle apparatus or the C CDK7 complex is part of the cell cycle apparatus and is in a sense what we call downstream of the CDK4-6 and for that matter CDK2. Um, and so this can block the cell division process. Um, and there are some promising results in small trial in breast cancer. Um, but, you know, the trial only contained about 31 patients um, and the 8 percent had for, uh, partial response, but a fair number had stabilized disease and one patient was on the trial for over a year. So certainly an area of intense interest, particularly in patients who whose tumors have become resistant to CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, the uh, PROTAC is uh, basically an estrogen receptor uh, degrader using a different mechanism um, than fulvestrant or oral SIRDs, um, and also has some uh, data in, in the clinic that suggests that it has activity. The, the exciting part of that is that it's, in a sense, a, a designer type of uh, molecule uh, agent that can actually be modified to a target a number of different types of things, not just estrogen receptor. And what is the role of CAR T cell therapy in treating those with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative MBC? Yeah, so CAR T, of course, are uh, cells, T cells that have been modified, so they're patient derived T cells that have been modified to react strongly against a particular uh, target. Um, so the ones that are uh, of interest in breast cancer include HER2 as a target, mesothelin uh, is a target, uh, and there are a couple of others. At this point, there's almost no clinical data, however, saying uh, how good these are. Um, you know, there are uh, scattered trials in breast cancer ongoing. These are obviously standard of care in some lymphomas and have dramatic responses. They are also quite toxic and expensive. So one of the problems is, uh, for example, confusion and other types of toxicities that result from these. So they clearly need to be studied and they hopefully will have an impact. Thank you. And that um, you might have answered some of this, but what new treatments are being investigated that we might know about in, say, one to three years? Well, I think, first of all, I'm involved with my phase one program at my institution, and I will, you know, a lot of them have triple negative breast cancer, for example, as one of the cohorts. In fact, it's my lament that they don't have a lot of ER positive breast cancers because that's not seen as such a, a um, unmet need. Uh, but I would argue that since breast cancer is 75% ER positive, we really, and we have a lot of patients in the metastatic setting with that, we really need those types of trials. I do think that immune therapy will um, come of age. Clearly, single agent PDL1 or PD1 therapy is not particularly effective, but it is, and nor is the combination with CTLA4 antibodies. But there are a whole host of new molecules that are targeting the immune system at, in various points, and combination therapy will be, I think, really uh, important and probably successful. Um, you know, the PARP7 uh, inhibitor, the um, BCL2 inhibitor, there's quite a few different uh, targets that are being developed. 
uh, that really do look interesting, do seem to have some activity. Um, how to combine all these and pick out the right patients for the, the right approach is the difficult part. So biomarkers, predictive biomarkers are increasingly important uh, to try to figure out who might get treated with what. Okay, thank you. Okay. So into the Q&A box, I see um, for estrogen receptor positive and HER2 negative, is an aromatase inhibitor plus CDK46 combination toxic? And if so, how is this toxicity handled and is it detectable in a blood test? So there are three CDK46 inhibitors currently on the market. Alibocyclib, uh, ribocyclib, and abemocyclib. And there are a couple others coming along as well. But um, so albocyclib and abemocyclib have predominantly uh, neutrophil toxicity. The good news is they don't cause a lot of mucositis and therefore not much barrier breakdown. And so fever and neutropenia is rare. We do need to modify the dose um, based on the neutrophil count, usually on day 15. But these are usually pretty well tolerated. There is fatigue as probably the main complaint. And I would reiterate that exercise ironically is in fact the best antidote for exercise. Um, a bemocyclib, slightly different toxicities, so more diarrhea and GI toxicity. That one is given continuously, not as a three week on, one week off. Um, so that's basically, they're relatively straightforward to handle. Dr. Elias, real quick, there was also a question about why we start at the max doses on these CDK4-6 inhibitors, specifically for a bemocyclib or Verzenio. I would agree with you that many of the targeted agents, uh, first of all, some of the toxicities get better over time, particularly diarrhea. And, um, and sometimes I actually start at a lower dose and, and, and ramp up. Um, part of that might depend on how, um, how sick the patient is with the breast cancer. But you're right that we don't necessarily always have the right dose for the patient. Okay, thank you. So, okay, on to the next question. And so um, we can give um, kind of general information, but we might, we are not able to kind of answer specific in your specific um, case. So this one might be a little specific. So um, Dr. Elias, you can handle it as you'd like. Due to past stem cell transplant and high dose chemo, um, my normal WBC ANC is low 3.0 side effect of CDK46, even at lowest dose, makes me neutropenic 1.0. What can I do other treatment options? Right. So, I mean, uh, if I have a patient who has uh, trouble tolerating it, one can be invented with the dose. So one could do two weeks out of three. One can do alter in others alternate schedules. It depends a little bit on which drug one uses. So as I mentioned, a bevacyclib has less uh, uh, toxicity to the neutrophils. So maybe that would be a better choice than palbocyclib or ribocyclib. Um, but there, it's still probably an effective drug now. These lower doses have not been formally studied. So the bottom line is one's off label. Yeah, I mean, one's off the sort of um, tarmac, so to speak, but um, one can be uh, inventive and just, you know, monitor the disease and how good the uh, therapy is. Okay, thank you. Um, for those below 40 years of age with ER positive, um, HER2 negative cancer, one lymph node positive, what weight should be given to Oncotype DS's risk score and decision on CT administration? So more of a clinical question here. 
versus adjuvant therapy and in the responder trial, um, the women who were premenopausal, so, so women were random with node positive disease, one to three node positive disease were randomized to um, endocrine therapy with or without chemotherapy if their score was zero to 25. If they had a score higher than that, they got chemotherapy anyway. Um, what was found is that if you were premenopausal, that any score was associated with benefit of chemotherapy. So even a score of zero, uh, although I'm sure there were not very many of those. Um, so we would generally recommend chemotherapy for somebody under 40. Okay. Um, Right-sided, HER2 positive, breast cancer, two nodes positive for disease, all scans negative. So this question would be about prognosis. Yeah, that's a little tough uh, because I don't have quite enough information. Nonetheless, um, you know, HER2 positive disease is a, an aggressive cancer. So before the days of oh, trastuzumab and other anti-HER2 therapy, the patients fared as well as triple negative breast cancer, meaning it was not good. Um, now, the good news is that chemotherapy plus anti-HER2 therapy reduces the risk, whatever the risk is, by about 75% or more of whatever that risk was. So, it you know, with two nodes positive, there's a fairly sizable uh, risk. It also depends on how big the tumor is and so forth. But um, but we can reduce that risk, um, and that would have a significant survival advantage. Okay. How do antibody drug conjugate treatments work, and are they intravenous? They are intravenous. They're basically an antibody linked to a type of chemotherapy drug. And basically they bind to the target, for example, HER2, on the cell surface of the uh, tumor cell. They can bind to cell surface of other normal structures as well, of course. Um, but basically once it's bind, bound, it gets internalized, the, the toxin is broken off from the antibody and causes toxic effects. So in general, they have two fold types of effects. One is the anti-HER2 treatment, which by itself downregulates HER2 signaling and can kill tumor cells. And then they have the additional mechanism of adding the toxin to the tumor cells and bystanders that are in, in the that are nearby that may have sort of lower or two targets. And for lung mets, why isn't surgical remover removal of tumor used more than drugs? So it depends on how many. Typically, breast cancer is rarely oligometastatic. So unfortunately, most of the time, breast cancer has quite a bit of um, invasion and multiple um, lung uh, nodules are seen as well as other sites. So a solitary lung nodule certainly would be considered for surgery uh, if and only if uh, because it might be a lung cancer. So I've certainly had patients who've had a breast cancer found to have a lung nodule and it turned out actually to be a new, a, a new localized stage one lung cancer and we cured it with, with surgery. So it, it will very much depend on, um, you know, circumstances. Um, this is a question about PDL one status. So what exactly is it? So PDL one, so uh, programmed death ligand one is a molecule that's expressed on uh, frequently by macrophages and sometimes tumor cells, 
but usually in the in the connective tissue interspersed in the tumor. And it's actually stimulated by the uh, macrophage support for the tumor. The PD-1 is, is the receptor on the T cell. And when those two bind together, it in, inactivates the T cell. Could you please advise if taking low dose tamoxifen would result in lack of its effect efficacy at the time of metastatic ER positive breast cancer? Sorry. Sorry, right here. See that. Um, oh, there we go. So low dose tamoxifen there is one study from Italy that suggests that low dose tamoxifen, namely five milligrams daily, may be quite active. And of course, the the usual dose of twenty milligrams is a little arbitrary. You know, there weren't that many dose binding uh, trials when tamoxifen was first developed in the nineteen fifties or something like that. Um, as a failed birth control pill, and then subsequently as a breast cancer treatment. Um, so there is some suggestion that it can work. Now, when if a tumor has been exposed to tamoxifen, then it can become resistant through a variety of mechanisms. I don't necessarily think that the dose of the tamoxifen is quite as critical. Um, why is Verzenio started at the highest dose? Um, and so why not start at low and increase as tolerated to avoid side effects? Yeah, no, no I mean, it's a good question. Uh, you know, the bottom line is it wasn't studied that way. Um, <laughs> and, and so we don't really know, uh, and we don't have a trial that starts at lower dose and ramps up. Uh, you know, we can certainly point to capecitabine, for example, as a chemotherapy drug that got approved at the wrong dose. So the FDA approved it at uh, 2,500 milligrams per meter squared per day, you know, in divided doses, and nobody uses that. Okay, we usually use either 2,000 milligrams per meter squared or even just a straight 1,500 milligrams twice daily, uh, 14 days on, seven days off. So. I think we'll need more study of that. And um, so it's a good question. Mm -hmm. When is radiation therapy considered um, an appropriate treatment? So typically if there's a problematic lesion, so pain, for example, radiation therapy is really good at alleviating pain um, if we know what to aim at. Um, and uh, so if there's a solitary bone metastasis, that's a really good thing. The other area is fracture risk. So if you have a lesion in the, fem in the femur, in the femoral neck, that's at risk of, uh, of fracture or preferably before it is at risk. So if it's just hurting, then radiation to that is, is good because it then potentially prevents you from having to have orthopedic surgery or a hip fracture. Brain, of course, is another area. Radiation to chase every last lesion, however, has not been shown to be useful. Earlier in the presentation, cancer-related fatigue was discussed and how bodily movement is crucial is a crucial way to help reduce its severity. In the case of metastatic breast cancer or those in palliative care in general, would the prescription of exercise be appropriate? And how is exercise oncology used to help reduce treatment side effects and improve the quality of life in metastatic breast cancer patients? Carly, do you want to answer that? Up to you. Uh, yeah, sure. I can give it a go. Um, so. I think that yes, as a general answer that exercise can be prescribed as a means to help fatigue in a metastatic breast cancer patient or a patient in palliative care 
in general. Um, how we do that, um, it can be guided and recommended by the oncologist, the nursing team, or we can lean on our supportive care services. Um, um, there are teams of people in fields called rehab oncology that can be helpful to cater certain activity programs to the patient. Um, and I think that's the key is catering to the patient. Um, everybody's abilities will be different depending on how their disease and treatments are affecting them. But um, the general rule of thumb is the more active a patient is, the better energy levels that they will have overall. Um, something else that could be helpful, depending on if there's a specific area of weakness would be physical therapy, occupational therapy. So yes. I just want to, oh, I just want to add to that just, uh, you know, aromatase inhibitors, of course, cause achiness and stiffness. And the major antidote to that is movement and stretching and keeping active. Um, so it's really important. So do you find um, that patients struggle maybe with the motivation or just kind of you know, you don't feel well, but you have to move to feel better. But, um, you know, and I'm wondering if this idea of a prescription, because then maybe insurance is paying for, you know, the kind of the, the personal attention, so to speak, the motivator. You know, I personally believe that we have enough information to be able to write prescriptions for exercise. Um, on the other hand, insurance companies have generally been resistant and Frankly, the size of the clinical trials that have shown that exercise improves outcomes has been a little bit too small um, and to, to persuade an insurance company to actually do that. Now, there are some insurance companies that will, in fact, uh, help subsidize gym um, memberships. Uh, our cancer center has a program for exercise for our breast cancer survivors, um, but um, but of course it's not necessarily convenient because it's you know you have to come to our campus. We're actually in the process also of developing a virtual what it's called be fit be well, which is basically where we can provide the same type of exercise program online. Um, it may not be quite as good as in person, but it is still effective. Okay, great. We need coaches. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> All of us. Every single one of us. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so I think some of our other questions have been answered, but let's just, um, this, we'll ask this um, for our last question. So, what considerations should be taken into account when choosing a radiotherapy um, provider for radiotherapy? <laughs> I'll be shot. Uh, well, you know, it depends on the complexity of the radiation, whether uh, it should be given beforehand. And so, there could be some technical issues. If it's straightforward radiation, then, frankly, logistics is the most important. Is it close to you? Because radiation um, now, so for curative effect, it's usually given as a five week, four week, whatever, six week um, program daily, Monday through Friday. But for palliative effect, we frequently give either one to big dose or maybe two, or sometimes we give stereotactic over three doses, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So it depends on how uh, technically difficult it is. In general, we try to get a, a local radia radiation oncologist to deliver radiation. Okay, thank you. So, um, even though it's a patient and caregiver webinar, we, we do have healthcare providers that attend our webinars. So, um, sometimes the questions might be um, a little complex. We'll just want to prepare you for that. 
Um, so active treatment has been superior to supportive care based on quality of life. So our attendees might want to know the difference between active treatment and supportive care. Um, and so this question is, is that based uh, for pro metrics or objective biological outcomes or both? Right, so um, quality of life, of course, has been um, tried. One measures it in many different ways. And of course, in the old times, you'd ask the physician, how did the patient do? And that was sort of like a listing of the toxicities. And as we know, of course, the patients have actually less knowledge than the nurses do. And of course, much less knowledge than the patients do in terms of how they are actually feeling. Um, so, um, PRO or patient reported outcomes are basically a set of fairly well validated questionnaires that patients fill out and grade themselves in terms of how they're feeling. And there's a variety of different fields that give you uh, insight as to various types of side effects as well as global uh, health of that nature. So best supportive care is considered radiation therapy, pain control, palliative care medicine, um, and other supportive oncology, but it does not include active anti-cancer treatment that's systemic. So typically, even though we are giving palliative chemotherapy, in other words, chemotherapy designed to make a patient feel better, um, it, uh, that type of therapy is what we call active therapy. And in general, most of the randomized trials comparing uh, active therapy versus best supportive care have been uh, in favor of the active therapy in terms of all of these outcomes, including a slight advantage in terms of survival. Um, Ultimately, that brings up the question of at what point do you stop treatment? And this is a difficult question because I don't think there are any absolute standards. In general, what we look for is there's, of course, a law of diminishing return. In other words, if a tumor is responding to a first-line chemotherapy, they have a better chance of responding to a second line chemotherapy, even if the chemotherapy is different, uh, than a patient whose tumor is just growing right through the first line therapy, for example. So in general, if you have a tumor that's refractory to treatment, giving another type of therapy in sort of the same class of treatment is probably not gonna work very well. The second issue is we know that performance status is a really important concept. So performance status is basically how active is the patient. You know, somebody has a performance status of zero, and it's zero, one, two, three, four, five. Five actually is when you're dead. Um, but zero is fully functional, working, you know, uh, there are no limitations whatsoever. When you get to a performance status of three, um, you're in bed more than half the day. And generally speaking, pretty much all trials have demonstrated that the toxicity is way higher for somebody with a, a poor performance status. To, and the likelihood of benefit is way lower. So you might have a chemotherapy that has a 30% likelihood of shrinking tumor and another 20% likelihood of stabilizing it and so forth. Uh, but if you treat somebody with a performance status three, that same chemotherapy drug might have a likelihood of response of 2%. And so in general, if somebody is doing very poorly, therapy is not usually indicated unless there's something specifically reversible about that problem. 
Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, does re-expression of um, ER, estrogen receptor, or HER2 say anything about the potential outcome of the case? Does it change treatment options or considerations? The and answer, short answer is yes. The, the difficulty is we're playing whack-a-mole sometimes. So, in other words, a tumor that changes its stripes, and this might be ER and PR, HER2, but it can also be molecular mutations as well. So we can treat with therapy and we kill off one clone and another clone starts growing up. And now that we do molecular analysis uh, more frequently and circulating tumor DNA is a, a, another way to buy, sort of quote biopsy the tumor, um, we start seeing this heterogeneity. And heterogeneous tumors are harder to treat than homogeneous tumors. And that leads up um, into the next question about how do you know to re-biopsy to um, see if tumor biology has changed or, um, you know, are we biopsying each uh, metastasis? How do you manage that? Right. So I'd say we're still trying try to figure that out. Uh, part of it depends on whether we have something potentially useful for the patient um, and that we actually have a choice in the matter. Uh, so if one's, for example, stuck a little bit and you do, let's say, circulating tumor DNA. So, so one of the things about Tumor biopsy versus circulating tumor DNA is probably important. So if you biopsy a specific tumor, you are biopsying that particular clone and the tissue is very concentrated, you get very good signal. When you get circulating tumor DNA, you're collecting a blood and in the DNA in that blood, you have normal DNA and then you have DNA that's been shed by the tumor, either because the tumor's dying or because it's just releasing it. And so we don't get as much of a signal out of that. On the other hand, we get an averaging from all of the clones that might be in the patient. So you can actually get a sense of whether one mutation is more likely or more prevalent than another one, and that might guide how you patient. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think I'm going to skip down a couple. Um, so you, I think you, you answered this, but I will ask it. Um, in estrogen receptor positive metastatic breast cancer, what is the average number of different lines of treatment given? before progression becomes untreatable. And um, and perhaps Mary Lou would like to weigh in because I know she has strong feelings about yeah, this as well. Uh, Mary Lou? I'm sorry, I thought you were going to Dr. Elias first. Um, <laughs> So, uh, said enough. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Um, so, would you repeat the question? Um, so, the question is about the average number of different lines of treatment given before progression becomes untreatable. So, um, Dr. Elias talked a little bit about performance status. And so, from your perspective, um, you know, why don't you just talk about how many lines of therapy? I think it is very individual. It's, it's what the patient can tolerate, and it's what the patient wants. Um, you know, we've um, asked patients uh, how much side effect will they accept for how much benefit. And in some cases, we could never get anyone to say they still would take treatment even if there was 1% benefit and the toxicity was high. And usually that was because they had young children living at home. So 
your life situation, your own tolerance, um, and and your kind of what what your goals are for yourself uh, come into play. I don't think there's a one size fits all. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so uh, there's some question about um, like bone strengthening agents. Um, uh, isn't zoledronic acid also used to avoid having MBC um, spread to bones? Right. So both zoledronic acid and denosumab have been tested in the adjuvant setting quite extensively. I mean, there are uh, some 23,000 women randomized to trials of this nature. And the trials basically probably in some show a very modest, small effect, suggesting that bone strengthening agents reduce the risk of relapse um, in patients. And it's not clear that it's ER positive necessarily or ER negative, and it's not completely clear that it's bone only um, metastasis as opposed to just generalized metastasis. The effect is small, and I would say actually across the country, various NCCN um, institutions look at this uh, differently and do not feel compelled to treat. So, for example, Memorial Sloan Kettering, I believe, basically treats everybody with zoledronic acid. Um, other places are more nuanced. They will treat, uh, they will test bone density and then treat anyone who has slightly weak bones, uh, but not treat people who have great bones. The problem being that we have not been able to identify the characteristic of the patient who actually seems to benefit. And so we'd be, you know, treating an awful lot of patients with these agents uh, with a relatively small benefit. Um, and there are some toxicities to these agents. For metastasis to the brain, um, so what is the standard therapy for that? Yeah, so it, it depends on how many and where and what. Um, so, if you have a solitary metastasis, just a single one, then typically we consider either surgical resection or stereotactic radiation. So, stereotactic radiation has a variety of names. It's basically focused radiation to that spot, high dose. And it's called gamma knife, and it's called cyber knife, and it's called all sorts of things um, based on commercial interests. Um, so they're both quite effective. There are some slight differences in terms of the size of the lesion and whether the lesion is cystic or whether it's bleeding uh, in terms of which might be preferable and certainly where it's located in terms of what the morbidity of the uh, surgery might be, for example. Um, so there's somewhat different toxins. If one has many, then we usually go with the radiation and we try to do, avoid whole brain radiation if possible, because that is associated with a decrease in cognitive function uh, six to 12 months later. Um, and we try to avoid that. Okay, thank you. Um, would it most likely be necessary to be treated at a cancer center, uh, sorry, cancer care research hospital for rebiopsy genetic testing? Sorry. So would it, um, you know, I think Perhaps the question is, I mean, I think at NCCN, we, we kind of, we recommend if available that you go to a specialized center, you need to be treated with those who have, ex, you know, who are experts in your type of cancer. Perhaps that's the 
question. Um, maybe they're saying, can my, can my biopsy be done anywhere? Can my genetic testing be done anywhere? It's, it's not necessarily um, where they're taking the sample that matters. It's where the pathologist or the, the testing right. center. So in general, uh, you know, the testing, a lot of it, is, uh, many institutions of the big cancer centers do internal testing as well as send out to various uh, companies. Certainly those people, oncologists in private practice, generally can do send out to um, very good um, uh, commercial entities to get molecular testing. I think the question is always what can you do with it? So the bottom line is when you do molecular testing, you might pick up actionable mutations in four to 10%, let's say. So what does actionable mean? Well, it means that we have either a standard drug or more likely an experimental drug that is being tested against that particular type of mutation. Well, those types of trials are generally available in a major cancer center and usually not available to the uh, practicing oncologists in the community. That doesn't mean it's wrong to test that. It means that one might have to get referred in for these types of opportunities. What does it mean that a tumor is no longer active? Is it still there, but simply not growing? Right. So when we look at CAT scans and things like that, the criteria for benefit from a radiographic point of view is stable or better. And the reason why stable, in other words, the lesion is same size, it hasn't budged is that some of the, you know, what we see as a shadow on the CT is made up of sort of four basic elements, living tumor cells, dead tumor cells, scar, and inflammatory cells. And we can't really tell how, what's in those. But clinically, the patients who have stability of disease seem to feel better. Their symptoms have gotten better. They live as long as people who've had good responses. Um, so that's why we use those types of criteria in terms of determining whether we uh, continue treatment or not. Um, but it's a difficult area. So we did have a question earlier about like, what is preclinical? And, and I think it might be helpful to say, what is clinical? You know, what, what do those really mean? Cause you hear it as, you know, uh, patient. Oh. Yeah, so. clinical generally means human, um, you know, human uh, testing or experience. Uh, preclinical typically means either work in the laboratory on cells or even molecules or uh, model systems like mice. Okay. What is a CDK4-6 inhibitor? Ah, sorry. I, you know, we try not to go through all of them, but basically CDK4 and CDK6 are cyclin dependent kinase is, and are important in regulating the cell cycle. If you remember that from high school biology. Um, so cells divide by, you know, going through a cycle of preparing the cell to duplicate its DNA and then duplicate itself. Well, it turns out inhibitors of this process are very effective against S receptor positive breast cancer. Um, and there's research to see whether we can extend that to other types of tumors, but. Uh, so there are three of them that are currently commercially available. There's palbocyclib, ribocyclib, and abemocyclib. Um, they do have uh, commercial names as well. Um, and they've been shown when put together with anti-estrogen therapy, otherwise known as endocrine therapy, they have dramatically improved uh, both progression-free survival in other words, the tumor's not growing, 
for a longer period of time, basically a doubling, and also even survival. So we use these typically in first line treatment of metastatic ER positive disease. There is some indications for high risk um, local disease that we also actually would use these to reduce risk of relapse. Great, thank you. Um, so if there is spread to bones, L5, and in numerous other locations, and progression is minimal, and patient is still asymptomatic, current treatment, um, Pablo fall restaurant seven years, would stati uh, stereotactic radiation to the lesion not be recommended? Right, so that's, oh, we, we certainly would radiate a lesion like that if it were symptomatic. So if it caused pain, we would definitely recommend radiation. When somebody's totally asymptomatic, radiating that particular one spot isn't going to affect the overall systemic treatment of the breast cancer. And so there's no real benefit, certainly. Uh, now, where we get antsy in terms of trying to radiate are uh, weight-bearing structures. So femoral neck, you know, the, the, uh, the, the hip bone, uh, if that's significantly involved, I mean, if it's a tiny spot, it's not a big deal, but if it's a, a bigger spot, we don't want somebody to get a fracture. Um, and so we will radiate even if it's not symptomatic, but if it's big enough. Uh, so, what are your thoughts about integrating holistic medicine after treatment? So, it sort of depends a little. Well, I'm going to let some other folks talk about this. The one thing I'm going to say uh, is I don't like supplements. <laughs> okay. okay. So, why don't I like supplements? Well, uh, basically because I consider the internet to be a source of really bad data um, or information. So antioxidants, and this is my hobby horse, okay, so forgive me, but they're dangerous. They actually are detrimental to your health. And, you know, basically we know that antioxidants in, oxidants in general do protect normal cells from things like radiation and chemotherapy, toxicity, and stuff like that, and I totally agree. But when you put them in the same laboratory setting and test normal cells mixed with cancer cells, it turns out these agents actually protect the cancer cells more so. So all of the randomized studies that have tested the healthfulness of antioxidants have actually um, shown that the supplement was detrimental. In other words, those patients got more cancer, more heart disease, mm. more um, disease. So it was not helpful, even though the internet says it's great for you. So I think too then, um, and I will ask um, Carly and Mary Lou to um, offer some insight that it's always a good idea to talk to your your oncologist, I mean, they're, I mean, if you, you or your pharmacist, they understand about, right, turmeric and drug interactions and, and what might be permissible or okay in someone without a disease or who isn't a survivor is you just the biology. I think we're learning here, right? The, our biology, the biology of tumors, it's all very complex and the interactions of the drugs. So um, definitely talk to your care team. Um, and so, um, Carly, what would you add about kind of, because sometimes your slides talked, I thought your slides were a holistic approach, right? Exercise, hydrate, exercise, exercise. You know, these things will make you stronger and help you through okay. your treatment. So just quickly to piggyback on what Dr. Elias was saying, um, I, I do agree that um, use of supplements can be difficult. Um, you know, we understand patients want to be doing more to support themselves throughout treatment, um, but unfortunately, we're quite limited in knowing the actual benefit of 
of sub of sub of supplements. They're just not regulated the way that our other medicines are. So while a pharmacist can be helpful, we can only know so much about certain supplements. And um, but I would say that a pharmacist is a great resource, and we can share what we know, or the pharmacist can share what they know about any supplement that a patient is interested in taking. Um, and then to answer the question in general, um, what are your thoughts about integrating holistic medicine? I certainly am an advocate of any kind of supportive medicine um, or supportive care that is vetted by the oncologist as well. Um, and I emphasize supportive care versus treatment. Now we have some patients that um, are preferring a naturopathic treatment regimen and, and that is completely up to the patient. Again, you know, knowledge is power and it's up to the patient what treatment they would like to um, accept. And um, we can be there in a supportive way to guide and give recommendations and make sure the patient is as well informed as possible of all their options. Um, and then from a holistic approach, if that means like, um, you know, certain therapies, acupuncture, um, approved supplements, physical therapies, all of these, you know, definitely a holistic approach to the supportive care setting. So managing side effects, managing toxicity, we certainly recommend and welcome all therapies. Yes. And Mary Lou, any thoughts? Yes, um, the patients that we've interviewed, um, most of the breast cancer patients are looking for something else. What can I do? that will help me live longer. And so I know that it's frowned upon in some ways, uh, but I think it's realistic to recognize that patients are looking for things and so help them by giving them things that are safe and might be helpful to them. Things like a change in diet, exercise, obviously, like, like Carly said, um, meditation, you know, perhaps vitamins, if those are approved on, on lists. Um, and, of course, you know, talk with your health care team. They, they need to know what you're doing at, because it could be counter to what they're trying to accomplish. But um, I, I think most of us, myself included, um, I changed my habits, my way of eating, um, a lot of people will, will limit alcohol because they, were, they know that isn't um, helpful. So uh, I, I think it, it's one of those things where you need to work with your health care team. And, and I want the health care team not to see the patient as being uh, provocative in saying, is there something else I can do? It's, it's just the patient wanting to live. Yeah, just to come to the full circle, what I do really push and I'm enthusiastic about is exercise and a good diet. Those have global health benefits that have been shown. It's really hard, but it, it really is proven to be a good thing. I'm a fairly good fan of acupuncture and things like that for certain things. Um, so there are definitely uh, things that are not sort of traditional medicine that really work. Um, mindfulness can be very helpful for um, for certain types of uh, symptoms and uh, toxicities of treatment. Um, so it's not that I'm against everything, but <laughs> supplements I worry about. I um and I remember when we were preparing the slides, we were talking about back pain, right? That the people go to the chiropractor for back pain, not realizing, right, that it could be. So maybe you could just address that. You know, you're you think, oh, my neck hurts. Oh, I'm going to get an adjustment. I'm going to do. I'm going to get a massage, not knowing, and they don't know, right? If you're not telling them your history, so maybe you could just address that. Yes, so I unfortunately have had patients who've sort of been uh, attending acupuncture and and um, chiropractor and er even orthopedic surgeons and for back pain um, and but never really told their uh, 
oncologists because they were, let's say, eight years out from their breast cancer. And as I mentioned, particularly for ER positive tumors, you really have to still remember that you had breast cancer back when uh, and that it can come back even 20, 30 years later, although it's rare, you know, so with each passage of six months, the likelihood of it coming back is lower, but um, it's still possible. So any symptom that's out of the ordinary or really troublesome, you should talk to your oncologist and they will think about it. They will think of whether you know, they'll, they'll give you some suggestions, they'll, modify, they'll monitor this, and if it's not improving, then they'll get a scan and look. Um, and unfortunately, some of the time it is, in fact, recurring breast cancer. So unfortunately, we are out of time, and we really thank you for enjoying uh, for joining today, the NCCN Foundation would also like the, to thank the corporate supporter of this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone.